Barbara Jones has made her career out of teaching anthropology and researching human perceptions of nature. After earning a bachelor's degree in agricultural economics from Virginia Tech and a PhD in anthropology from Rutgers University, she has written articles for Culture, Agriculture, Food, and Environment, Journal of An Ecological Anthropology, Anthropolog Anthropological Perspectives on Economic Development and Integration, Practicing Anthropology, and Anthropology News. She is also the author of Wild Capital, Nature's Economic and Ecological Wealth. Her current research focuses on reimagining the narratives for nature's inconvenient species. Um, yeah, I got interested in this topic. Uh, obviously, as an anthropologist, I'm interested in the social dimension of things, particularly with nature. And this was a fascinating one to me because it seems like the language we use, the stories we tell, create ways of seeing. And that way of seeing is further to creates boundaries. And just as this picture indicates, uh, I was driving through the back roads uh, between Grand Tetons and the National Forest, and I come to this boundary sign where we understand the rules change, but wildlife does not. You know, on one side of the boundary, the wildlife is safe. On the other side of the boundary, they can be shot trapped, whatever it might be. And so by using language of nuisance, pest, all that, we further reaffirm that boundary. So that that's kind of where I started with this. Um, and this to me, I know it's not a beaver, but it, it <laughs> makes a good point. This was a really neat example. This coyote, this um, you know, environmental historian is, says, what is it doing swaggering, not even skulking? but strutting as though it had every right to be there through human space in broad daylight. And it says, this was haughty behavior indeed, and a creature for all its dog-like appearance was a bother, a nuisance, a pest, and a trespasser. And I live in suburban New Jersey, and when wildlife comes through, they're not welcome because they don't belong there. They belong somewhere else. And we create boundaries, and this animal was a boundary crosser. And so we see this all over the place. I, in the summers, I'm doing research out in Montana, and this is a classic thing where the elk are not supposed to be in a farmer's land. They're not supposed to be grazing on his grass for his cattle, but they're wild, and that's where they go. And so there are a lot of social issues about this. And what happens is we have this whole idea of man's dominion over nature, and there exists an imaginary border that separates us from them. And one is highly controlled where we manage that space and the other is wild and uncontrollable and it makes many people very nervous and they're unhappy and uncomfortable if they can't control every aspect of their lives. And so this wild, wild you know, nature border crossing occurs and becomes disruptive so that we want them to behave appropriately in our human space. And so a colony of beaver that enters the domain of the rancher and floods the rancher's land, or a wolf that stresses elk, making them more difficult to hunt, they've crossed that regulated border created in our imagination. And so by violating the space, they've defied what we call orderly civilization. You know, what are they doing here flooding our roads? Or what are they doing here chasing our cattle? and they brought the unimaginable wild into our midst. So we have signs, wildlife on the roads, because the wildlife are not supposed to be on the road, but do they know that that's a road? No, they don't. Um, so assigning narratives and metaphors through neg using negative human attributes, we in a way anthropomorphize animals through this language. And we attribute to the offending species a long-standing response to our defiance of rules. So the beaver becomes a pest, the wolf vermin, bison, nuisance, and the gray seal, a thief. All words that say what? Do you want them in your presence? No, because they're bad guys, right? Uh, so this is an example in a suburban neighborhood. That's a red fox in someone's yard. Those foxes disappeared. They were living, doing their own thing, not bothering anybody, but somebody saw them in a playground field, and the next day the wolves were gone. I mean, not the wolves, sorry, the foxes were gone because they are not part of a suburban landscape. So for coexistence to exist, we need to reimagine our narratives. 
And in doing that, we need to consider both the metaphors and the stories we use. And when we think about coyotes in New York City Central Park or foxes in somebody's yard, um, we are imagining animals as outsiders. And in the anthropological parlance, we call it othering, where we assign them attributes that are extremely negative and create fear and make them more foreign than they need to be. And so the problem with invented boundaries then comes with the idea that wild and wilderness are social constructs based on the idea that wilderness is a space untrammeled by man and wild is untamed. But it really makes no sense because in both instances, they parallel a spatial understanding of that is framed by what it means to be a highly managed species, like cities that, that live in highly managed spaces, excuse me, like cities or towns versus being what famous Aldo Leopold described as the distance you can travel in two weeks without crossing any roads and, you know, being out in wilderness. And these things fail to capture how humans and wildlife are embedded in a shared nature that includes our space and their space, coexisting with an interconnected web. And the case here is, again, sorry, not beaver, but these are bison, and they are considered to be livestock. So the minute they leave Yellowstone National Park or Custer State Park or anywhere where they are constrained behind fences, Yellowstone is the freest any bison can be. They go from being a wild animal in the park, they step out of the park, they become livestock. And they are controlled by the rules of livestock and agriculture, and they can be shot. So that is the mere idea of stepping a hoof across an imaginary boundary. And it completely changes our relationship with the animal. And so with the beaver, they've had some really poor PR. Um, you know, early beaver economics meant a lot of dead beaver, you know, the pelts, the all sorts of things, their furs were traded all over until they were nearly decimated. Um, then they became nuisances and pests. And that pest narrative is tied to the idea of native versus non-native, which is a really interesting distinction because in places in the U.S., there are historical accounts that will document that the beaver was non-native because it wasn't there when the scientists started studying beaver. Well, <laughs> they were there. They're part of Native American lore. There are documentations in the archaeological record that they were there. But because they're treated as non-native, a whole new set of rules applies to the species. They're varmint. They've varmints. They've been accused of eating fish. Um, rodents. Once you are classified as a rodent, we have in our mind what jumps into our head. Rats. You know, you think of a beaver in a subway in New York City, I think it's a totally different animal than a rat, but they're all clumped together as the same thing when you call them pests. Um, the Nuisance Rodent Act that exists in some of the states clump beaver in with these traditional pest species. Um, and then some people have even gone so far back, not that many years ago, to create categories of bad and good animals, which I think is just hysterically funny because animals don't understand the concept of bad versus good. Wolf hunt to kill so they can feed their family. They are not engaged in bad behavior, but to humans, that's bad. Why are they killing those things? So it's a very interesting thing. So then we've got the issues of costs associated with flooding and tree and shrub damage. One of our neighbors freaks out because we have a local beaver and they don't know what to do. And so they do flashing lights and all this, like we're at some kind of, you know, jazz party or something trying to scare them away and it's not working real well. Um, so this was an interesting thing and it, it comes back to what I mentioned earlier. Joseph Grinnell was a, uh, an ecologist, and he wrote a really the definitive book on mammals in California. And it talked about the historic ranges of animals like beaver and defined which ones were native to the state. So then a contemporary of his, um, Donald Tapp, he added to this knowledge by saying the beaver never lived along the coastal areas in California, the San Francisco Bay or the Sierra Nevada mountains. But curiously, the absence of beavers was understood through what a uh, fisheries biologist Daniel Pauly calls shifting baseline syndrome, where when it, if it doesn't exist when you start your research, it never existed. And obviously, we know that to be flawed. But it took years of people getting very vested in beaver to try and 
conflict, create a narrative that opposes the idea that beaver were not native throughout the state of California. And currently, because of this historical understanding of beaver, beaver is still managed as non-native species in a lot of place parts of California. Uh, and now, through archaeological sites, historical fur trapping records, newspaper accounts, geographical place names, all saying that beaver were part of California throughout its history. But it's really hard to debunk an established narrative. And once that narrative sticks, it's really hard to change the story, all right? Um, so here we have this whole thing, a border of words, when beaver were restored to the mountains in California, spart sportsmen and farmers saw this as returning the animal to its rightful place. But when that same animal appeared on a levee strewn delta, which on the canals where people fished and you know the farmers worked their land, they were seen as vermin. So in the exact same state, in two separate places, the animal had a totally different relationship with the people who shared that space, all depending on whether the people wanted it there or they didn't want it there. And when they don't want it there, they call it vermin. And what do we do with vermin? Call pest control. We poison them. We trap them, whatever it may be. So in this case, once an imaginary boundary is crossed, beavers shift from being the face of wilderness to becoming distasteful and unwanted vermin. Invisible boundaries are reinforced by metaphors that maintain nuisance beaver reality. And that, to me, is the whole funk idea here. How can you have coexistence if we rely on metaphors and stories that completely defy the idea of coexistence, right? So this is an interesting example because this is a park. This is in New Jersey over by Trenton. And because this isn't a park, beaver are welcome. But that park has what? Boundaries. And so as soon as the beaver move out of that park to find other habitat, they're no longer revered with signs and, you know, people hike trails to go see them. They're a pest. And what's also interesting with this is how ways of seeing are deeply embedded in our understanding of wildlife. So here we have native stories. Humans are just one part of a larger natural world. To Southern First Nation people, they're taught seven guiding principles in the restoration of their culture. And the beaver are one of those, are, represent the principle of wisdom. And they see that as not to be confused with knowledge. Wisdom is gained through experience. And they tie that to the beaver because when one pollutes the water, one does not break a human law, but the law of nature which states that to poison the water is to destroy oneself. That is in total contrast to the settler's idea of nature. So settler stories, European Americans viewed people as the central figure in their world who defied nature and exploited it for their own ends. Uh, domination drove them to convert land into highly managed farmland and they operated through the metaphor agrarian ideal where using land for productive purposes was the best use. And that ideal land meant you had to remove predators, large ungulates, smaller keystone species like the beaver. And even going back, which plays into this European settlement idea, is in the 16th century, there was a Tudor Vermin Act, which was called Keepers of the Grain, where beaver were called a monstrous rat. Many Social scientists can trace our attitudes in the United States back to Europe. And with the settlement of the United States, they brought all those myths and stories with them. And the wolf was the number one victim of that and was completely eradicated in the lower 48, except in small pockets in Minnesota. Uh, so anyhow, the economics of species survival has helped Beaver. Uh, Archibald Stansfield Bellany, uh, he was called Gray Owl. He was excluded from trapping beaver and otter because he was not a resident Indian, as the government of Ontario required. And that led him to shift his relationship from being a trapper and killing beaver to seeing beaver as wilderness and their absence resulted in wasteland. So be, by being excluded from trapping, he changed his position on beaver.
And in doing that, created new metaphors that encouraged a new way of seeing beaver in the public's imagination. And then we have James Watt, who was part of the Hudson Bay Company, and he had a similar relationship with beaver, tied to economics. And I don't know if any of you are familiar with Garrett Hardin with his tragedy of the commons um, or Eleanor Ostrom with her work on governing the commons. But both of them would have thought James Watt was the greatest thing going because he created an institution that protected beaver because it made no sense to kill your primary resource. And if you can't, if you have no beaver, you can't make any money off beaver. So he protected them because they were an economic resource. And characters like this in the story help change how the fact that beaver persisted when a lot of other species did not. So Garrett Hardin's tragedy of the commons is just that. It's the idea that if it's common use, who controls who takes the last one? And that tragedy has permeated our lived experience from everything from the passenger pigeon to the near loss of the bison to the gray wolf and almost to the beaver. And Eleanor Ostrom, who she actually was a prestigious economist, she used the idea of governing the commons as a way for communities to avoid a tragedy of the commons by collectively self-governing their community pool resources. So in Watt's day, he did something that was very unusual and even novel by protecting community pool resources, by making laws and rules and when you can harvest and when you can't. So governing the hot commons did not happen for bison, elk, or even cod. But Watt and Bellany, to some degree, did it for beaver. And that's why we still can talk about beaver today, which is a really cool thing. Um, and now we're in the thing that really gets me jazzed is the idea of revaluing. And that's what we're doing with beaver now. And recognizing nature's ecological and economic capital through their social, economic, and ecological values. So, I mean, you all, I don't want to repeat all these things because you all know, but beaver do absolutely amazing things. Even more so than the obvious as engineers is the idea that they actually act to produce nitrogen and carbon sinks. In this era of climate change, what is better than something that sequesters carbon? And through their construction of dams, they sequester carbon and they also return nitrogen to the soil as a sink. So these are really amazing things. Tourism, which is a totally untapped value in the United States, is growing all over Europe and Great Britain, which I think is fascinating. And that's another way that we can assign value, that people pay money to go see something that adds to their value. Um, salmon restoration, where beaver used to be accused of wiping out fish habitats, they're now credited with actually protecting and creating through their deep ponds and things like that. So, and then the final one is their intrinsic value, the knowing they exist value. And that's a hard one to measure, but that's an important one with beaver too, because we don't know what the landscape looked like pre-European settlement. And many people would argue the land we see today is totally different because of the absence of beaver. Um, so the ecosystem services, are, the whole idea behind them are those services that provide or enhance our human well-being. And there are two competing groups who vie for attention in the environmental narrative. And one of the group is the environmental pragmatist, and the other group would be the environmental purist. And the pragmatists see solutions to resource issues can be found by working with human needs in a complementary way. And that really feeds into the ecosystem services idea. Um, they offer stakeholders a voice in the process of preservation and conservation, and they encourage decision makers to consider nature-based solutions. So those pragmatists like real things that can be done knowing human behavior. And on the flip side, we have environmental purists who tend to see environment ecosystem services as pandering to the human in the room and that they're not giving enough space to wildlife and to keep human influence out of nature so that we can maximize, maximize biodiversity. But together, the pragmatists and the purists offer 
a path forward for our relationship with nature. Purists offer the ideal, what the perfect thing would be for us in the future. Pragmatists offer the potential real. They're the ones that say, we can work with this species if we are willing to relocate them or if we are going to put in pond levelers, whatever it might be. A purist would say we're pandering to humans. But if we want to talk about the elephant in the room, who is the elephant in the room? Us. And if we're not happy, change is not going to happen. So you ha- the blend of the two, the pragmatists and the purists together, are our path forward. Uh, just to give you some examples, this is Island Beach State Park in New Jersey. After Superstorm Sandy and all the beach erosion and everything, they started repurposing Christmas trees as a way to salvage the dunes. That's pragmatism. It's not what nature intended, a bunch of evergreens being shoved on a shore beach, but it's holding the sand in place. Um, Another is creating living breakwater oyster reefs. And sometimes they're artificially created with old subway cars or whatever it might be. But we're also starting to use oysters. And those are examples of doing things to create real outcomes, but they're not purely environmental. But if we're going to share this planet, that's what we have to do. We have to make some compromises. And what I think is really cool about this whole idea of changing narratives and moving forward is this building of resilience. There are two kinds of resilience. And we all know if we're studying anything to do with nature, that resilience is critical. And that's why biodiversity is so important. Uh, Natural resilience which would be like with our friend the beaver, is proactive. It maintains or builds natural assets or functions. Um, It's comprehensive and systems-based instead of a one-trick pony that fixes this problem over here and then 47 problems occur over here. And it's less expensive in the long run because it's done by working with a self-regulating ecological system. Engineer resilience, on the other hand, tends to be reactive meaning it replicates a function or changes our expectation after something bad has happened in the ecosystem. Um, It reduces the system to its parts, which I don't know if any one of you has ever read any of the literature about, you know, the idea of bolts in a beam and how nature can tolerate losing a few bolts in the beam, but if you take all the bolts away, what happens to the beam? It collapses. And that's what resilience is all about, maintaining as many working bolts in that beam. And with engineered resilience, it reduces the system to its parts and offers discrete benefits, and it replaces a missing piece without understanding that that missing piece might have ripple effects over here, or its absence might destroy the ecosystem. And they're more expensive because they need human labor and they're built on human capital. And so when we think about those, these are just some examples. Natural resilience, you know, you introduce beaver, they're now discovering they're the greatest thing for fire reduction in woods, forests, because they keep the ground wet and spongy. Um, Pollution reduction, soil loss. In the Everglades, They built, if anyone's ever traveled on the Tamiani Trail through the Everglades, which takes you from Tampa over to Miami, that road became the equivalent of a dam. And the water could not flow through the Everglades because there's a highway. And so they're raising the highway to let the water return. All of these are examples of engineering things that are trying to enhance resilience. So maintaining water flow, you can't have a berm that runs across the entire path of the Everglades. Um, maintain connectivity with migration corridors. We're finally learning that animals do not just stay in Yellowstone National Park or the Great Smoky Mountains. They have traditional migratory routes. And if you've got, you know, the New Jersey Turnpike or I-95 that cuts right through their migratory route, what is happening to those animals that are trying to get from one side of the interstate to the other? They get killed. So the argument is car insurance, human fatalities, are the impetus to get people to put in wildlife corridor connections, meaning underpasses, wildlife overpasses. But the pragmatists would say, if we have to appeal to the human and the insurance company, the end game is the same, right? We're gonna have wildlife corridors that are protected. But if you go by the purists, they'd say, well, get rid of the highways. You know, we don't need them. Well, of course we do. How do people get from here to there? So that all of these things are tied together. 
Um, another one is planting native perennial grasses. For farmers, if instead of you do an annual crop like corn, you plant a perennial grass that can be used as a food crop and then less need for plowing. No, less carbon is released into the atmosphere. Moving the cattle around the landscape like bison is another example of natural resilience. Um, native plants for pollination and so on. We tend to rely on the second column, engineered resilience with dams and berms and canals. Um, in England, they have something called innings where there are embankments around marshes. We have wildlife management and wildlife services that dictate what animals can live and where they can live. Uh, we rely on monocultures and overproduction of food, species eradication, and impervious fencing and walls. These things fix maybe this problem right here for that moment, but the long-term consequences of them are the ripple effects into an entire ecosystem. So those are important things to consider when we think of pragmatism versus purism also. And to me, what's interesting with the beaver, and that's why I'm working with it for this next book project I'm on, is the success of the beaver that it has made what I would call in social science terms, the beaver shift. Um, it is still seen as a commodity and as a nuisance in many places. Uh, it was over trapped. Obviously we created fur deserts. Uh, the country, even as recently as the 1980s, the country was polluted with beaver, which is a polluted, a positive word. And, and if we're talking about metaphors, no, you know, beaver are polluters. That, that's not a good thing. Um, they became vermin, which I think this one is particularly interesting. The last two Canadian descendant, beaver descendants living in Britain were given the warm and fuzzy names of Adolf and Eva. So what do you want if you want to keep these beaver? Oh yeah, they're, they're Hitler's clan. I mean, you're not, that's not the, what you would want to associate with the beaver. Um, misconceptions that they carry disease, they steal water, they eat fish. I mean, I was at the Washington Zoo, the, the National Zoo, I don't know, three months ago, and I was interviewing people at the Beaver Overlook. And I hear this father telling his kid, well, the kid says, well, what do beaver eat? Oh, they eat fish. I couldn't stand it. And I had to tell the guy, no, they don't eat fish. But this man was convinced, and he just rolled his eyes at me like, oh, man, we're there. Okay. But what is he now conveying to his kid is that beaver do what? eat fish, right? So, and then they emphasize the flooding and tree damage without emphasizing the amazing services they provide to human well-being. So we're shifting the narrative, beaver is the earth's kidneys, which is a cool thing. Um, beavers stand for something vital, something essential for wilderness. And in a way, the 21st century is very receptive to this kind of language, especially after COVID, where now people are really realizing how important being outdoors and in touch with nature. So that's kind of a cool thing, um, that there are keystone species and they compl you know, build complex, slow-moving water ecosystems, and they act as speed bumps. Um, I don't know if anybody's been watching the news, but in Montana with Yellowstone, the entire part of that state is flooded. The roads are impassable. Flooding is a real concern. And ranchers out west, much to my joy that I've spoken to, they are beginning to want beaver on their land because drought, especially if you're in the southwest of the United States, drought is killing them. And if you can keep water on the land longer, you're going to have a longer growing season and you're going to be able to keep your livestock alive. So that's another example of pragmatism. Um, beaver ecology has taken hold where the beaver return, re-wetting re re the sponge is a whole lot better than their polluters, right? Um, they enhance property values and they use trickle-down science to educate property owners. So this is a really neat beaver ship from this picture on the left, which I'm sure many of you have already seen, where beaver pelt after beaver pelt to this was at Grand Tetons National Park and people were crowding around. Oh, it's a beaver. It's a beaver. They were like, this is Kim Kardashian or something on the other side of the water. They were so excited. So this is a major shift and that's a really exciting thing. Um, beaver allies are tied to this whole ecosystem services idea. Slow water, now they're called Smokey the Beaver 
which is a positive connection, right, to Smokey the Bear, something children have learned about through their childhood. So beaver know they're now being seen a different way. So we've got slow water, they spread water, they sink water, they store water, they share water. So these are all really cool things, which ties into, which I think is fascinating, how other places are capitalizing on outreach and tourism as a way to educate people. These are just some of the places in beaver tourism in Belgium, they have tours called beer, beer beavers and castles. And people will travel on these tours and they'll go on hikes to see beavers and then they drink beer at the, you know, at the brewery at the end of the tour. Um, in Bernillis, they've reintroduced beaver as a revenue generator because all other aspects of their economy have tanked. Can you imagine using beaver as a way to restore your economy? But that's what they're doing. Scotland. Um, on the River Tay, they offer riverbank beaver safaris. I mean, this is just unheard of. The first time, well, there's only two instances that I've seen tourism in the United States. One is the Pinelands Alliance in Chemong, where they're offering beaver ecology tours now, kayaking tours. And the Bronx River Alliance, after beaver returned to the Bronx River, where the thing was, the river was on all intents and purposes dead, they now have guided tours. They have Justin Beaver as Beaver is one of the Beaver's names. They, 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 people are just so excited that Beaver are returning, which brings me to, and I'm going to hurry, 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 um, the endangered species bump, which I think is fascinating that many places around the country are realizing, many ranchers, farmers are realizing that they can be protected from endangered species land restrictions if they provide habitat. So in Wyoming, where the trumpeter swan is the species of concern, they want wetlands. So ranchers are encouraged to get beavers back so that you can have compatible landscape for wetlands that would allow the trumpeter swan to have habitat. So that means if the trumpeter swan gets upgraded in its species of concern into something, you know, endangered or threatened, those ranchers have created habitat and are protected. So that's another neat tie between beaver and the pragmatic solution. We're still fighting this battle of heritage versus science, where heritage says trapping is a time-honored tradition. Mm -hmm. I don't want the government telling me I can't kill those beavers. Family heritage. Um, the irony, it's the joy of being in the woods. I know that defies my worldview that how can you get joy out of pulling a dead beaver out of a trap, but that's a heritage thing. So as an anthropologist, I have to understand that. Um, climate change, though, is the flip thing, where if, Trapping is not cost effective. If anyone's ever seen the prices of beaver pelts now, they're worth nothing. So why would you trap? Um, but climate change is the thing that is changing this story. And that's an important thing to keep aware of. Um, beaver management allows us to have restoration across boundaries where one person who in Great Britain is writing, she wrote about the, or rather in Canada, about transboundary partnerships where you encourage coexistence across groups of competing users. That's tied to that whole pragmatic thing. The challenge though still is the native versus non-native, the noisy opposition to beaver, which tends to be the loudest voice in the room, the trappers, the ranchers, nuisance laws. Um, so a lot of this stuff can also create problems because a successful recovery can be too successful. And if you have too many of them, what do you do then? Um, and this is an example of that. Um, I was in San Diego not that long ago, and the children's beach is closed because the seal recovery has been so great that they now give birth on the children's beach. Well, knowing humans as I know humans, how many years are they going to tolerate their favorite children's beach full of seals and making pooping in the water and giving birth? It's fun for a couple, you know, a few weeks. But if you can't bring your kids to their favorite place to swim, how long is that going to be tolerated? Um, so renewed coexistence is a really cool thing. And I'm going to kind of finish up with this where, um, in England, they're using the language of renewed to build on what they see as familiarity with a species that is gone, but is now being reintroduced. And their idea is the human tie to the species can diminish challenges, but it also diminishes its wildlife wildness. Um, 
because when you reintroduce a species, people then expect you to manage them. They can't be wild if you brought them here, right? So renewed, his idea was untangles that tie. I'm not convinced because to me, the past human beaver relationship has not necessarily been a good one. So if you're going on past familiarity, you're relying on a narrative that isn't proactive beaver, really. But renewed coexistence does allow people to form new relationships because the animal is not totally foreign. And so that's a neat idea that comes from that. And so familiarity comes from beaver at zoos, beaver in pop culture, beaver in books, beaver as helpful friends. And here's that little group of people looking at the beaver in the Washington DC zoo. And it was a pretty big crowd considering when you go to the other overlooks, there were maybe two people. So beaver got some friends. And just to give us an idea with a recovering resource, this is grizzly bear 399 in Montana and why, I mean, in Wyoming, she was the most famous bear. She probably is the most famous bear in the world. She gave birth to four cubs two years ago, and she is the star. This is cars trying to see bear 399, but she, her recovery or the recovery of grizzly bears, this is the police station in Jackson, Wyoming. And in the middle of the night, five grizzly bears are walking right through there. Well, how do people respond to that? Bear, grizzly bears are dangerous. They could, what, it, what happens if you got between her and her cubs? So recovery is wonderful, but we also have to prepare people that success could bring us back to a time that isn't what it used to be, um, which is just what's happening with the seals, the great white sharks, same thing. They're all recovering. And now people see sharks when they're in the water. And Cape Cod's entire industry is based on tourism. Well, if you can't go in the ocean because there's sharks, what do you do? Do you have a coastal resource that people want? Um, which leads us to the nudge, decision-making and recognizing that we have to reward and incentivize to change behavior. Um, bias and positionality are part of people's worldview, but behavioral economic theory is different than classic economic theory because classic economists think of humans as rational actors. The behavioral economists know we're not that we've got passions and loves and all sorts of things that just you know drive our behavior so even though these ranchers know that watering their fields to make the grass grow is going to have elk eating all their grass they don't want the elk removed they don't want them shot but if a wolf came onto that land to kill one of those elk that wolf would be shot on sight yet they don't want the elk but they don't want the wolves either so it's a very interesting thing so coexistence is on a spectrum, meaning there are degrees of coexistence. And we have to accept that someone who, you know, does one little thing might be the beginning of a mind change, you know, and that needs to be recognized and rewarded. A lot of times in the ranching and farming community, and even in suburbia, we get so upset that people don't welcome 100% of what we love. But it's incremental. And if you recognize that you did this little thing, like painting your tree with sand, paint, you're doing something. And so that's an important piece. And the whole idea is the business of living, moving from that view where all our land is in these blocks into something where it can be what Lewis Henry Morgan called the 19th century beaver districts, you know, where they were forever and ever. And this is just to give you a sense of how we have the challenges of coexistence. This is a pronghorn migration map, goes through towns and highways. Um, so anyhow, we have to make coexistence something so it's across all spaces, so that animals can move and they can't get shot. And in doing that, it might be like that, a wildlife crossing or for the beaver, allowing you know flooding to occur in a managed sort of way. Because if we don't, these are the outcomes leading to, you know, tragedy. Beaver in most parts of the United States, 1851. American bison by 1887, practically gone. Eastern elk, 1865, gone. White-tailed deer, 1940s, gone. Passenger, I mean, these are our tragedies. And we don't really want to continue with those in this era of coexistence. So that's it. And I did want to just introduce... Florida Press says, 
Take books, every conference you go to. So I'm bringing books, and this is my Wild Capital book. I have a few copies, but if anyone was interested, you can get it with this special code for $30. But anyhow, thank you for your time, and I'm done. And if there's any questions. Thank you. Um, I'm, this is your practitioner and your outreach audience. Um, can you, how do you stay engaged with us to give us better language and, and think about how do we also learn from what you're doing to engage around the coexistence and, and working with the pest species that we love to work with? Well, I think you touched on a really good point. And that's where I think a lot of this is we have to be more intentional with our language. And I noticed, I think, in the media publication that you guys, somebody put out, Adam put out for this, he had the language to use. And I think a lot of it is scientists are not their best friend, own best friends. Um, I remember when they first started talking about climate change, they used the word global warming. And then it opened it up to jokes with, you know, and I'm not picking on any particular person, but like Donald Trump would say, well, I'm freezing to death here. What's this with global warming? So that undermines the idea that climate change is not just warming, it's all aspects of climate change. And so when we talk about species, one of the biggest things I've found in my research is people who do little snippets for coexistence never get recognized. They always get told this is not enough. So like a rancher who joins Rocky Mountain, or a hunter, let's say, joins Rocky Mountain Elk Foundation, he sees he's contributing to all land being put into, you know, habitat for elk. That's a good thing. But someone like me thinks, well, you're doing that so you can shoot them. How is that coexistence? But that land would not have been returned to wild nature for all other species if they were not contributing to this elk foundation to get elk back on that land. So that kind of coexistence has to be recognized as an effort. And I think we tend to be very literal, all or nothing. And that's not what coexistence is. We have to take snippets. We have to take and accept that not everyone is going to get on board. Coexistence has even gotten a bad rap now. If you talk to people out West, they hate the word coexistence. They don't even want to hear it because to them, coexistence has always been somebody yelling in them their face that they're not doing the right thing. So not only do we have to change the language about how we talk about species, but we also have to take, have a greater tolerance for what people are willing to give or do. And that comes with this behavioral economic nudge that I commend you for doing A, and with that, can I build something better rather than, well, that's not enough, which tells me, well, why bother? I'm, I can't ever win. So I think that's, and that's really hard to do, but that's what we're going to have to do. And scientists are the worst communicators in the whole world. They, they, don't, they don't message well because they assume everyone is understanding things from their lens. But that's not how it works. So we need to be better communicators. And that to me is what's come from my research. But anyhow, thank you. <laughs>